too many things. Too many things. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you can all find your seats, um, I want to thank everybody. How's my volume? Is you guys, we're good with this? Okay, I think we're good. I think I didn't have the mic up high enough last time. Sorry. Um, <laughs> as I'm trying to give all these tips to the students and I don't pay attention to what I'm telling everybody. Uh, my name is Gwen Roth. I am the coordinator for the Caring for Our Watersheds Ohio contest. And I want to introduce my partner in crime, Katie Naniger. Um, Katie helps to uh, run the contest or to recruit for the contest up in Northern Ohio. So we work together as partners to help this event come together. Okay. In my day job, I am the education specialist with the Hamilton County Conservation District. So we are going to talk all about caring for our watersheds, which you have probably heard your students talk about a little bit. Oh my God, I got to go up and talk about people and it's scary. It, it's a little intimidating, but they're all going to do awesome. Um, so caring for our watersheds is a global competition. It takes place in eight different regions in North and South America. And in Ohio, it's sponsored by Nutrien. It's sponsored by the Hamilton County Conservation District and Nutrients for Life. Um, since my job is an educator and I have a captive audience, I'm going to educate you a little bit. Uh, all of the students have already seen this video, but it's really helpful for the parents um, and those of us who haven't seen it to learn a little bit more about our watersheds. So as I said before, all the students have seen this video maybe a few times, um, but a watershed is not a river, a lake, or a stream. A watershed is that whole area of land that's shedding or draining into that body of water. So when our students are talking about watersheds today and they're talking about what they did to help their watershed, some of their projects may include air quality. Absolutely, that is part of our watershed. So it's not just I have to go and do a stream cleanup. Okay, so all of this area is encompassing what a watershed truly is. So in the state of Ohio, we have two major watersheds. We have this orange blob right here. That is the Ohio River watershed and covers parts of 13 different states, which means everything within that orange area is actually draining into, it's shedding into the Ohio River, okay? And we also have the Lake Erie watershed, and that includes parts of five different states and Ontario, Canada. Okay, even though that whole teal area up there, that's the entire Great Lakes watershed. But the, Ohio, uh, the Lake Erie watershed is only parts of five different states and Ontario, Canada. And the main rivers we have down here in Hamilton County, obviously the Great Miami River on the west side, the Mill Creek that runs right through the center of our county, and the Little Miami River on the east side. Now, as I said before, Caring for Our Watersheds is a global competition. Uh, it takes place in several provinces in Canada. Um, it's in Greeley, Colorado, Sacramento, California, the Chesapeake Bay Watershed and the state of Ohio in the United States. And then it also takes place in Argentina. 
And when I went out and I talked to students about this, I said, don't worry, you're not competing against students in Canada or Argentina, okay? But it is nice to know that literally students all over the world are doing some of the same similar things that these students here in Ohio are doing. So how does this contest work? Um, way back in the fall, September, October, November, I would go out to classes, Katie would go out to classes and we'd talk to students about this contest. And the main question we asked is, what can you do to improve your watershed? It's not what can I do? What can your teacher do? What can your principal do? What can our president do? It's what can you do? And we really wanted students to be empowered about how they could help. So we asked them to think about what are some problems in your community and how can you fix that? So we went through some brainstorming activities. We came up with some issues and we asked them to write approximately a thousand word proposal, which already for some students is a little intimidating, I get, um, but they wrote that proposal coming up with some type of realistic solution. These are some of the realistic solutions we've had in the past, and you will see some many, many more realistic solutions today. So those proposals were reviewed by a group of judges, and we started first with our pre-sort judges. Now our pre-sort judges have um, a pretty hard task because they have to read through all of the proposals that came in. So they read through all of those proposals, they will score all of those proposals and they narrow them down for the next round of judging. And I do wanna give a shout out to all of these judges um, because as you will notice throughout this day, I'm the one standing up here with a speaker, with a microphone. I sometimes am the face of this contest here in Ohio, but I am not the only one doing work here, okay? It really takes a village to pull all this together. Um, so all of these people, Dennis, Rachel actually reviewed pro proposals from her grad school in Scotland, okay? Sarah, Mallory, Emily, Kylie, Heather, Kristen, Sarah, Elise, Tony, Emily, and Kat all got together, some of them did it virtually, some of them did it in person in our office and went through and narrowed down those proposals for the next round of judging. And then our next round of judging, we call our written judging. And those proposals went through a more rigorous uh, score sheet. Uh, and those judges reviewed all of those. They had a discussion and they came up with our top 10 that is here today. Um, so Ellen, Penny, Lori, Mary, Sarah, Gia, Corey, Emily, Sarah, Anne, Nikki, and Fia. Um, like I said, some of those people are here today and definitely want to thank them for all of the work they do. A lot of those written judges then will go on and become mentors for those students and those teams. So every team gets a mentor. Every team gets a budget of up to $1,000 to go and implement what they said they were gonna do when they first wrote that proposal back in the beginning of the year. So then we end up here today. We've narrowed down to the top 10. That top 10 was chosen in late February. Um, and from then, from early March until now, those students have been working really hard, really hard to implement their projects. And they are here today to give a five minute presentation about their projects in front of our group of judges. A shout out to the students. These judges have no idea what you have done, okay? They have not seen your written proposals, okay? So don't assume that. You guys know that already, but just an extra shout out that they have not seen them before. So Pat Bruns, a retired art teacher and uh, ODE board member, uh, former board member, uh, Scott Huber, I'm going in the backwards order because that's the way they're sitting in my brain. Uh, Scott Huber, who's a board member uh, with Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District, where I work. Uh, Jason Laughlin, who's the production and quality manager of Nutrien here locally. And Holly Chrisman, who is our assistant county administrator. So they are our judges here today. They have an unenviable task. Uh, I'm sure none of us want to put ourselves in that hot seat. Um, and what I think is one of the most important shout outs 
is to our teachers. Um, if you have not told your teacher today, thank you, you need to. <laughs> and that is not just for caring for our watersheds, that is for them being a teacher. Um, I have been in the education field for over 20 years. I have seen what teachers have gone through. I think it's even harder than ever. And I think every single day, we should be thanking the teachers for everything that they're doing for our students. So I would like a round of applause for all of these amazing people. So I am super glad that they chose to bring caring for our watersheds into their classroom, but I'm also super glad that they chose to be a teacher and chose to stick it out as a teacher. So I think they are highly deserving of that round of applause. Um, and then I wanna thank our, our volunteers that are helping to make this day happen. Um, we have Mindy Hartley who's sitting in the back and she's gonna help us with time. We have Sharon Johnson and my mama, Claudia Zare, who are our registration folks. Uh, Grace Davis, who is our intern and has been helping me for the past several months. So all of your students will probably recognize that name. There's that face that goes with that. Um, obviously, Katie Naniger uh, with Nutrients for Life and Emma, who's wandering around, Emma Solstead, who's wandering around with our uh, camera today. So if you guys want any pictures that, that you want Emma to take, just walk up. She'll take your picture. It's not, not a big, she has a list of things that I need, but she'll take any pictures you need. Okay. And especially a big shout out to all the students. Okay. Um, as I said, this is an amazing project for them to be involved in. Uh, some of these students were required as part of a class assignment to write a proposal and turn it in. Fingers crossed that they would never get chosen. And now here they are. Okay. Um, so it, it's, it's been a little trying for some of them, but again, they, they have done amazing, amazing things. And you will see with their presentations after we're done, how amazing they actually are. Um, so I have notes here too. I told all the students they could have notes and of course then I don't pay attention to mine. So now I'm gonna grab them so I make sure I say everything I need to say. Um, as we're doing our presentations today, I would ask that you not get up and go out. We're gonna close these doors during the student's presentation um, and then please don't come in when the doors are closed. We'll open them back up during questions. We're trying to eliminate as many distractions as possible. Um, for some students, this might be terrifying to get up here with a microphone. So we're gonna try and be as helpful as possible with that. Um, I want every single person that is in this room to take this out and make sure it is on silent. Okay, even though you were super sure it was on silent before you put it in your pocket or your coat or your purse, please, please, please double check. Again, it's not so big a deal for me, but it can be very, very distracting for a student and really throw them off their game. So please, 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 I will even make sure mine is on silent because I don't want to be that one after I told all of you to put it on silent. Um, again, if you need to use the restrooms, they are out this door and to the right at the end of the hall. And then all of you should have received a little program today. Inside this program, okay, there's our agenda. We're gonna try and stick to our agenda as much as possible. Students already know this. I don't know, you've heard me say this or email this to you maybe a hundred times. How many minutes do you have for your presentation today? Five, okay? They all know that, they all have five minutes. So we have a timer in the very back of the room. Mindy, if you will hand, hold up your hand there. So she has signs. The first sign says one minute. The next sign says 30 seconds, and the next sign says finish. Okay, yellow, orange, red. So it is not distracting for any of you, but as you're looking up here as a student, you can see your presentation on that back television screen, and you can see Mindy right there with that timer. So you know that's your time is just about up. 
So before we get started today, the last thing I want to do is I want to give a round of applause to all of our students because I want you to know this. They were the top 10 out of over 100 entries in the state of Ohio. So already they are winners. So. Excellent job. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to try and make sure technology works as it never does for me. There we go. Okay. And we are going to start with our first presenter, who is a student from Spencer Center for Gifted and Exceptional Students. And his name is Lloyd. So Lloyd, if you want to come on up here and I'll get your presentation started. Hopefully. There we go. Okay. No, sir. <clears throat> when do the time start? Uh, whenever you start talking, the time will start. <laughs> Hello, I'm Lloyd Parr. I'm a junior at Spencer Center, and I'm here to talk to you about reducing paper towel waste. So what's with the changes? Well, I originally proposed replacing paper towels with cloth rolls at school, but the school board didn't improve. Instead, I expanded my educational campaign to all Spencer families. It takes 17 trees and over 20,000 gallons of water to make a single ton of paper towels. Cutting down trees removes a carbon sink and deep roots that prevent erosion. Using lots of water and mixing it with chemicals reduces an already limited resource. And sending waste to the landfill takes up space and releases pollution as it decomposes. According to a survey that I conducted, 75% of my school uses more than one paper towel to dry their hands. One even used eight. I'm changing this. We have hand dryers, but 79% of Spencer did not use them. They worried about germs, so I taught them the most sanitary way to use them as seen. I also created this poster to promote air drying. However, some people still won't use hand dryers, so I taught them how to use one paper towel in assemblies, created these posters as reminders at sinks, and created a jingle PSA for hall TVs. Students even helped sing, further increasing their commitment. Let's watch. We can probably tell them to go to the waste of the plane. But you want to take a turn. That's a whole lot of impact at school, but why stop there? Most of us use paper towels at home too, so I expanded my campaign. I conducted, oh, I conducted a survey on paper towel use in our student and staff's home. About 44% are used for cleaning and 24% for hand drying. I encourage students and staff to use cloth towels for hand drying at home and introduce them to Swedish dust cloths for cleaning. I even gave them their own to start the change. As you can see in the budget in front of you, I'll give you one time. I purchased Swedish dish cloths, printed instructions and posters, and bought stickers for prizes. All this led to an even bigger impact than my original plan. Let me explain. 
By reducing paper towels at school and promoting reusable towels at home, my project meets the 12th sustainable development goal. Let me show the impact. Our school orders a quarter of a ton of paper towels per year. By using one paper towel, we can save over two trees and 2,500 gallons of water and reduce one eighth of a ton of waste per year. But our home impact is even greater. If every Spencer family changed cleaning and drying at home, we can reduce around 74 tons of waste and save over 1,258 trees and 1,480,000 gallons of water every year. Thank you for your time. Have any questions? So at this point, we have the opportunity for our judges to ask Lloyd a few questions about his presentation. So judges, do you have any questions? Remember, you have to turn it on. Okay. Lloyd. Hello. Just had a question uh, on the your decision for the Swedish uh, towels. How did you arrive at that, like that particular uh, one? Well, <laughs> Considering that I couldn't use uh, reusable cloth towels dispensers, I decided to use reusable cloths at for home for the students to bring at home since I can't use cloth towel dispensers at home and at school. Any other questions? Hello. Uh, good morning, Lloyd. Um, mm. It seems like you um, invited a variety of, of, of your colleagues, of staff and students and community into this. Were there any obstacles that were difficult to get over to kind of get the songs done, get all the different people to well, participate? Yes, there was a difficulty. I kind of had to do like, I presented a bunch of to my students, like all of Spencer, like all 314 of them. And I had to do it like this week and last week. So Monday, uh, so last week I had to do it like all week long doing presentations to in front of every, uh, to most of Spencer. And then like this week, like Mon like around Monday and Tuesday, I had to finish it up with like third and fourth and the uh, ninth and 10th graders. So yeah, it was kind of hard for the timing of all of it. I also had to email all the teachers and staff to get timing down. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Good morning. It sounds like you're doing a lot of trying to do a lot of behavior change at school. How do you see that continuing, if at all? Well, I well I considered that. Um, I'll think about it later. I I apologize. Thank you, but um, I have considered about that, and I'm going to be uh, at Spencer next year. So perhaps I can continue to do my work next year. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, Lloyd. I can still not tell me. Yep. Yep. Awesome. See, I tell you, one thing that's awesome about Lloyd's presentation, too. Um, Lloyd had had like he said he presented for those cloth towel things um, that he was going to put in school and he went to the administration and said let's do this and the administration said no. So completely shifting, which is very hard for some of us so excellent excellent job Lloyd thank well, you so very much. Before that, um, nobody else has done like a little song to go along with 
Uh, yep, that's the first time. I I believe that is the first song we've had at Caring for Our Watersheds Ohio. So I, I truly believe that is the case. Um, so we're going to give the judges just a few minutes to uh, tabulate Lloyd's scores. And in the meantime, we're going to call up Kira, Aaron, Ian, and Malia and their proposal to be the change. Okay. It doesn't look like a fish Hi, everybody. Where be the change from Loveland High School? I'm Ian. This is Kira, Malia, and Aaron. So we live in the Little Miami watershed, which covers a total of 15 counties in Ohio and drains a total of 1,758 square miles. This area has been designated as a sole source aquifer by the US EPA, meaning that at least 50% of our drinking water comes from some source in our watershed. If this area were to somehow get contaminated, there would be no reasonably available alternative drinking water sources. Did you know that the average American disposes of 110 pounds of single-use plastic every year? Just think of how much one plastic baggie weighs. Single-use plastic is created in bulk by some of the biggest industries in the world, but most tend to not notice the fact that seemingly harmless everyday use can have a detrimental impact on our environment and our watershed. If this plastic is not disposed of properly, for example, it could be littered outside, it will dispose into it will photodegrade into toxic and often harmful microplastics that can affect plants, animals, and even humans. Even if this plastic is not disposed of, is disposed of properly, it still adds to total waste on our earth. And in addition, it is created from crude oil and its production generates massive amounts of pollution. To help solve this issue, we turn to beeswax wraps. Beeswax wraps are a more eco-friendly plastic bag and plastic wrap replacement. They biodegrade with no harmful effects and can be reused for up to a year, making them very cost efficient. Our plan was to get these wraps into people's hands for free. This is because people usually don't want to switch to more sustainable products because they don't want to spend money on something that they aren't sure will work yet. That's why we wanted to give them a chance to use and experience the wraps with no possible downside for them. To do this, we created kits. These kits were a brown paper bag and they consisted of a small beeswax wrap, a large or medium beeswax wrap, our pamphlet, and an instructional sheet of paper with cleaning and use. We spent about four hours making 250 kits. We spent a lot of time designing our pamphlets, which include information about beeswax wraps, the problem of plastic, our project, and how individuals can reduce their own plastic waste. We needed to have a detailed budget, so that we can maximize the amount of beeswax wraps we could buy and hand out. There's also a copy of our budget in your bags. So we bought beeswax wraps, bee keychains, paper bags, and printed our paper items at our school. Once we finished putting together our kits, we began handing them out to people in our community. We gave out kits in downtown Loveland and to students and staff at our school. In total, we gave out 220 kits with about 30 left over, which we will offer to everyone here after the presentations. Our pamphlet contained two QR codes. One of these led to our link tree, which contained links on how to make your own beeswax wraps and where to purchase them. This also contained a link to our website, which included information about us, our project, and how to be sustainable in everyday life. Our second QR code led to a survey, which allowed us to measure the full expanse of our impact. 
From the survey, we were able to see that while 85% of people had never used beeswax wraps before, 78% had a positive response and planned to use them in the future. From this form, we are also able to answer any questions people may have about beeswax wraps and receive feedback on our project. Although there may be a limit to the amount of people we can directly affect, we aim to create a ripple effect. We hope that recipients of the kits will share their new knowledge for beeswax wraps and will be inspired to be sustainable in other ways. So we hope to impact sustainable development goals three and six, which are meant to improve health and well-being alongside clean water and sanitation. We also aim to impact sub-target 14.1, which is meant to reduce marine debris and pollution. We are Be The Change, and we invite you to be the change with us. And thank you for this opportunity. Oh, I messed up. Uh, good morning. Especially appreciate the uh, QR codes where people can go get more information on their own. It's always available. Um, as far as the survey is concerned, is, um, do you have any um, plans to try to follow up to see um, if others will, you know, if they will continue to ripple effect or something? Would there be any way to um, kind of check, check in once in a while with that? So we don't have any future plans currently, but we did get 41 responses from the survey. And like I said, 78% said that they plan to use them in the future, whether that be all the time, most of the time, or sometimes. One more follow-up question. How many um, kits did you pass out, did you say? 250. Thank you. And in addition, we do have some still left over, and we will offer those to everyone here after the presentation. Good morning. Who is the supplier of the of the wraps? So we bought everything from Amazon, and the reason is because they offer like bulk beeswax wraps for a lower price than some of the other places we looked at, and we wanted to make sure we can maximize the amount we can hand out. And then they've also worked with our school before, so we knew it would be easier to order. If your project takes off, would you have any communication with them to? Uh, if they can handle the demand? Um, not to our knowledge, but that's something we can definitely look into. Thank you. Just curious, I'm assuming you all use the product? Yeah. Do, do you, you like, would you recommend others follow yeah. your lead on this? Any problems with it at all? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, after we received them, we definitely had some left over. So we were each able to take them to our house and test them out. I found them really useful. If I have like a piece, like an orange slice or something, I can wrap it up and it preserves fresh fruit. I find it really useful and effective. They're reusable for up to a year. So I like them personally. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. So now we have two groups breathing a sigh of relief. It's over. <laughs> it is. Some people hate to be the first group and others are like, please, can I be the first group and get it over? Okay, while our judges are finishing up there, we have new technology at the zoo this year, so it's, <laughs> it's very, very nice, but now I have to pay attention to what I'm doing. <laughs> so our next group we have coming up to the stage from Mount Notre Dame High School, Kendall, Maya, and Audrey with their proposal on sustainable cooking. <laughs> You're doing just great, Audrey, just great. 
So we're going to make her hold the microphone and the clicker and all of that stuff. <laughs> so just forward and backward. And if you need the pointer, it's there. Hello, everyone. My name is Kendall. My name is Maya. I'm Audrey, and we go to Mount Notre Dame High School. For our project, we are sustainable cooking. So we created an environmentally friendly cookbook that has plant-based recipes. So there is no artificial flavors or chemicals added and it's beneficial to our bodies. So while enjoying a delicious treat or meal, you're also being healthy to yourself. To create the recipe cards, we use reusable cardstock from recyclable paper that also has a high gloss on it rather than using lamination, which can be biodegradable. We also use silicone bags, as you see, to hold the recipe cards, which is really good because instead of using plastic bags, they can't crumble into a million plastic pieces, which is good for our watershed. It's also accessible online through Band and Facebook. And on the back of each recipe card, there's farmer's market information. So we use local farmer's market for each different recipe where you can see where they are and where you can find the ingredients for it. So this is just an example of one of the front of our recipe cards. We used banana oat trail mix muffins, and you can see the ingredients are on it, and then the instructions are right below. And like I said, here's the example of the back of one of our recipe cards, which has the Blue Ash Farmer's Market as an example, and it says when the season starts, where it is, and there's also a fresh tip on the bottom for the specific recipe you're using. Okay, so our solution for this project is we wanted to focus on it being environmentally friendly. So we made sure to use products that are reusable and recyclable when we were making the packages and our cookbook. Another thing we wanted to do is make sure to create healthy recipes that are not only beneficial for our bodies, but for our environment. And another important thing is we wanted to inform our local M&D school about the importance of eating healthy and taking care of our environment. So we did that through our local um, community-based program band, and we posted on that and on Facebook. So with our project, our budget mostly consisted of the prints, the printed and laminated cards uh, from Staples, and then also the ingredients for the muffins that I made and the containers and storage bags. So for the sustainable development goals, our project emphasizes the use of local and fresh ingredients, which reduces the environmental impact of trucking foods cross country. So that's sustainable goal number 11 and 13. And we also, by using a plant-based diet, it's much more sustainable for our environment by not using as much water or gases. And what I'm referring to is the consumption of beef. By producing and raising cattle, it uses a lot of methane and water, which is really bad for our environment. And that's under 11 and 12 as well. So for our struggles, our first one that we had was with the silicone bags at first. When they first arrived, we had to open them all one at a time and they stick together at the beginning, but once they're open, they're pretty good. But when we did that, our hands were aching at first, but eventually we got them all open and it was fine. Our second struggle was between the three of us and our busy schedules. We all do completely different after school activities, whether like work or sports or Kendall does theater. So with productions and figuring out busy schedules, that was definitely one of the hardest things to do. And then our final struggle was with Amazon and Staples. Amazon was not very helpful when it came to shipping our products, not being consistent with their times they sent us. And Staples caused a lot of tears because they would not allow us to print our cards to the size we originally had. So we had to go over, reduce the size and continue to Photoshop them until we were able to print them out. So with the recipe cards, I uh, used the last one in the very last uh, which was the banana oat muffins. I decided I wanted to make them just to try out our products and maybe add my own. So I added some trail mix to it and we put them in the little packaging and I just test it out. 
So for the spread of our project, like we said earlier, we posted it to BAND through our environmental action team. And we also posted it on Facebook. So thank you, Mom, for doing that. A lot of people reached out and said that they were interested in our product. We also did a giveaway at our school. So we used a little printout of muffins and I put them all around the school. And we did an announcement and an email to say, if you found one of the muffins, you can go to Campus Ministry and get one of our um, little packs. So we ended up giving away 50 of those. Thank you all so much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed listening to our project. It might be a bribe. I'll ask the obvious question. How do they taste? Really? Yeah, very, very good. What's very. Your, give me all three of you. Give me your favorite. Uh, uh, my favorite is either the muffins or the, the kale salad. Mine is definitely the muffins. The best. Muffins as well. <laughs> Morning. Um, any interest in turning this into an entrepreneurial business? So remember when I said before, not all of these have anything to do with going out in a stream and picking up litter, okay? I think this might be the first cooking oriented presentation we've had at CFW too. So very, very interesting things happening. Okay, we'll give the judges just a few minutes to set up for our next group. From Loveland High School, we have Zachary and Ryan doing the community-based cleanup station in their polluted park. Hello? Backward, and if you need a laser pointer. This is for you. Yep. Yeah. And just get the judges. Hi, my name is Zach Peebles. And I'm Ryan Warney. Uh, I'm a sophomore at Loveland High School. I'm also a sophomore at Loveland High or School. I'm a senior, sorry. <laughs> 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 this, is our, this is our project. This is a trash pickup station. A little bit of information. Uh, so we're located in the Little Miami watershed, which has a population of about 3 million. And that's part of the Ohio River Basin, which is a much larger area. All right, so what exactly is the problem that we're tackling? So we have a couple of parks near our area, near our school. And I notice when I'm walking through them, there's a little bit more trash than I would like to see in the parks. So in an effort to keep this plastic out of the terrestrial, like 
food systems, you know, keeping it out of the animal's bodies, keeping them from eating it, keeping it out of the waterways, keeping the microplastics from getting into the water, we have come up with a solution. So our solution is what we call the trash pickup station. It's inspired by beach cleanup stations that have been successful kind of on the West Coast. And so it's basically going to be a wooden box that gets installed in a park. And inside of this box, there are coffee bags. These are coffee bags that we have sourced from local coffee places that would have been thrown out at the end of the night anyway. So instead of them just getting wasted, we're reusing them and putting them inside of the box. Anyone who comes in or in, into the park, they're going to go. They're going to pass the station. They'll pull, pull open the box grab a bag and then as they're walking around the park they'll fill up the bag with any trash they find and then on their way out of the park they'll throw away the bag and the trash inside of it and so this means that all of our project is community driven which means all of our community will be contributing to keeping our own parks clean it'll remove trash from the park quickly and on a regular basis to minimize damage and prevent buildups from happening again in the future It'll be maintained by the LHS green team in the future. So this means that uh, the, the class at our school that kind of does environmental work will be going into these parks uh, pretty regularly to make sure that all the signposts are still up, everything is still running smoothly, Re make sure that the um, boxes are still full of bags and everything like that. And so we already have permission from our city manager to install two, two in Phillips Park, which is kind of the most popular park. It's right next to the school. It's where a lot of the sports happen. So there's people coming in and, there, in and out of there all the time. And then we are going to install one in Kiwanis Park, which is a little bit of a smaller park, but it also has a lot of trails that people are walking on pretty regularly. So there's going to be trash building up there as well. And it's also cheap and easy to expand further into more parks in the future if this is successful. So we're addressing a couple of sustainable development goals here. We're tackling goals 6, 14, and 15, specifically the sub-targets of 6.3, 14.1, and 15.1, which all kind of fall under the same general category, which is keeping pollution and microplastics and other trash out of the terrestrial and marine environments and just protecting the ecosystems. Now, it's pretty obvious how we're doing this. You know, we're keeping the trash. The community is going to be helping us keep the trash out of the parks out of the water, picking it up, and just helping us keep the park clean. So here's our budget. Uh, so all costs and quantities are calculated for three stations. So it totals $406.82. And then if you divide this out, it's about $135.61 per box. And this is mostly in lumber costs. So we got a couple pictures here of our build. Over on the far left here, we've got a picture of the sign that we've got on top of the boxes. These are the coffee bags that we're going to have in the boxes here in the middle. And then this here is a picture of my mom helping me build these boxes. And then here's some of the final boxes. This is one before we put the sign of the posts on. The one in the middle is going to be what's installed in the parks with the sign on it. And then those two on the edge are the two pictures of where it, they uh, the, where they are going to be placed in Phillips Park, right next to those trash cans. And those are also right next to the parking lot. So anyone who's coming into the park will pass by them wherever they're going. It's also important to note with those last pictures that both of these trails loop. So you will be passing the same box in the same trash can on your way in and on your way out. So there's a pretty low chance that people will just take the bag, collect the trash, and then end up just littering it anyways. So this is a quote we grabbed from Frederick Gallo. He's a biologist. He's published a lot of papers. This is straight from one of his papers. He says that the impact of litter requires actions by communities to curb the ongoing flow of plastics and the toxic chemicals they contain into the environment. And we believe our project does exactly this as he wants by allowing our community to help keep all of these plastics out of our parks into the future. Thank you. <laughs> just I, I love the idea of the repurposed coffee bags how did you come up with that whose idea was it well we wanted to make sure that uh we weren't inadvertently adding more plastic into this problem so we didn't want to use like plastic bags or something that would just get thrown away so we thought, how could we make like the box itself even kind of more sustainable in that way? And the solution we came up with was we know that 
a lot of these coffee bags just get used like tons and tons of them every day at these coffee shops and they just get thrown away at the end of the day because none of them are recycled or at least most of them aren't. And so I thought a good way to kind of address two problems at once would be to use these, take them and use them in our projects. It's also a, a cheaper alternative for us in the project, other than having to go and repeatedly pay to get already made plastic bags. We're just repurposing them for free from these coffee shops. Good morning. So I appreciate your presentation because it, trash is a big deal. Uh, it, it's a lot you know, a lot more bigger than your park area here. And it's, it's a frustrating problem. So I appreciate you spending the time to uh, do a presentation on that in a project. Uh, just a couple questions. Any ideas on how you could expand this to uh, go outside of the park and in, into communities or maybe next to roadways or something like that, where there's also, a, a, you know, heavily, heavy accumulation of trash? Any ideas on that? Yeah, so like we said, it's pretty cheap to buy new boxes and have them installed. Uh, the, the city has been very cooperative with getting these installed in parks, so I think there is definitely a future that we could install them in schools or on roadways or anything like that. Um, I think it being in a park is getting the most foot traffic, so that's kind of where we started that. But uh, yeah, anywhere that there's going to be foot traffic, people coming in and out often, you could install one of these if, as long as you got permission, it'd probably be pretty effective. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, second question on the budget, uh, if I remember right, you were roughly around $400 total. Um, any reason that you stopped at that particular number instead of going to $600 or $800 or $900? We're putting two at a more popular park, and then we've got a a less popular park that we're putting one at. So it was simply just for the, the purpose of seeing how well they work. And then we can discuss, you know, the last 600, we can make at least three more boxes, maybe five, six, and then we can talk about expanding into more parks. We also didn't want to accidentally make extra and then get stuck with, you know, four or five boxes that we didn't have permission to plan anywhere. Cause at this point we were, when we were putting together the budget, that was before we had uh, kind of been reaching out to the city and making sure that we would have permission to install them as we were hoping we would be able to. Um, hi, um, also um, following up on those questions, I really appreciate also your strategic planning for doing it through a loop, you know, make it as, as you know, user-friendly as possible, right? Um, are you, uh, but a follow-up question would be, are you having any issues, um, barriers to um, resupplying those two boxes? I mean, that, is that something that you just have to do to go get? If that's a commitment so, on your part. Yeah. Is, he, is, he, is he sure he's a senior? <laughs> yes, I am a senior. <laughs> okay, cool. and he is going to graduate. Okay. So, for the duration of there, at least during the summer, it's not Oh, well, there we go. You, got, well, you, you, you know, teamwork. Um, but we, we have enough, sorry, we have enough coffee bags right now, we believe, to last us to the end of the year. Okay. And then we'll look into making sure we have sustainable sources for future years. Um, any um, discussion in your whole process of uh, further educating the community? Um, any any thoughts about that? Boxes. Uh, we'll probably expand the signage that's on them and more information to people and hopefully getting them in more areas gets the word around more. So we kind of just wanted to let that unfold by itself. Thank you, gentlemen. Excellent.
These students are getting a serious all around education. Okay, well, the judges are finishing up that. We're gonna get it set up for our last speaker before our break. And we have from the Spencer Center for Gifted and Exceptional Students, we have Ladesha and her project on native prairie species garden. Hi, my name is Ladesha Faulkner and I'm a junior at Spencer Center. Here is my native prairie species garden project. So a quick question for everyone. What would you rather see when you step outside? With a show of hands, who would rather see this? Now, who would rather see that? Pretty obvious here, everyone would rather see that. Well, unfortunately, this is what it looked like at my school. And that is what I'm trying to achieve by planting a native prairie species garden. So why does my school look like that? Well, as you can see here, here are photos from certain plots um, on the campus. My school has low biodiversity, clay-like soil, and few deep root systems. This creates rain to run off, which creates erosion and then pollutes the watershed. So why a native prairie species garden? Well, my garden will create deep root systems which absorb water into the soil and prevents runoff. This also attracts native species, including the endangered monarch. With the process of me creating this garden, I garnered many volunteers, which increases community investment and educates many on how to create their own garden. I will also am also providing them with free seed packets, which creates more gardens and the more the merrier. With this, so here is a, here is a photo of my, where the garden is located. Here is the main restoration area, which has a pathway in between. And this rectangle is the educational garden bed. The educational garden bed has the individual species so that you can see individually what each species in the wild restoration garden looks like. With this, accompanied with this, is the educational books. In your folders, I have copies of examples of them, which are not the real one. The real version is this. And this lets, lets the students and staff know about each individual species while they look into the garden bed and give them examples of how it functions, benefits, and a pretty cool fun fact. What I've done so far is I've set up both of these gardens I put down the identification tax that you see right there. And I planted it, the main restoration garden, but I'm not planting the educational bit until winter. And I'm gonna be planting that inside and transplanting it towards the, in the winter time. So with this, I had art students in, in different art classes create mosaic stepping stones and help me pour concrete into these stepping stones, which go inside of the, into the pathway. This creates and increases community investment inside the school. And the beauty of the garden, once it blooms, 
will inspire people to create more gardens. As you can see, there's buses behind me and across from this is a staff parking lot. So many students and staff see the hill that this garden is on all the time. So they'll be inspired when they see it to create their own and provide it with free seed packets. So I have given you all a copy of my budget. And with my budget, I was able to create this. So as you can see here, here is edging. And this edging is cheaper, easier to install, but permanent enough to not be mowed over. With creating the stepping stones, I used reusable stepping stone molds, molds, which were cheaper and more sustainable for use. With donated mulch, which was donated to me by a neighborhood garden, which will be placed on top of the garden, I was able to save money since it was free and invest more into community connections. With this, I was able to save funds to put money towards more professionally made things, such as the books and the plant tags I showed you in this sign. With this, it creates a large and long lasting environmental impact. So with this, I tackled many UN sustainable development goals, but the one I felt I tackled the most was goal number 15, which is life on land. With creating this garden, I've installed 21 new plant species into the campus, which attracts different species as well, including, like I said previously, the endangered monarch and many other pollinators. This then restores the biodiversity rate. Now let's discuss my impact numerically. So with the garden and seed packets, I have restored a quarter acre of prairie grasslands. This reduces 286,581 gallons of runoff per year, which gets absorbed by the soil of the garden. Around exactly 215 students, staff, and community volunteers invested their time into the garden. Hundreds learned with this, and the beautification community will maintain it. And this will create impact forever. Thank you all for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Questions? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, any written plan for sustainability after you're gone, maybe five to 10 years from now? Be kept maintained by the beautification committee and environmental science classes. This summer alone is my teacher will help insist me with this, like chopping. So basically it's just gonna be cutting off like a part, like, like chopping the garden so that it can outgrow and outcompete the species that were already there since they're native species. And then around five to 10 years from now, it will get to where it won't have to be chopped down and the species will outgrow and it will grow by itself forever. Um, just curious if you had any. Well, I wouldn't say I have met guy who moves and all that kind of stuff at my school. So I feel like as far as the school itself, not really. Yes. Sarah, are, it's around the school. Did you um, live there? Depending on it, how great it's looking or how excited they are about the project. The garden blooms, I'm pretty sure I'll probably see it. Oh my God, that looks cool walking down the street. <laughs> of course. Thank you so much. Okay, five down. Uh, we are going to take a little bit of a break um, and 
Our next presentation, we're going to push back and we're going to start at 1150. So if you guys, uh, there is some soda and some tea and some water over here if you want to grab a drink. Again, restrooms are out the door and to the right. And if I could see our next group, Hollis, Margot, and Kaylee up here really quickly.
Okay, so we've all had our little break. We've got five more amazing presentations to go. So I'm gonna call up our next group from Wyoming High School, Hollis, Kaylee, and Margot. Maybe ladies wanna come on up. Thank you. All right, I'm Morgan McPhail. I'm a junior at Wyoming High School. I'm Callie Hilton. I'm a junior at Wyoming High School. And I'm Hollis Hayes. I'm a senior at Wyoming High School. A little bit about our watershed. So we live in the Mill Creek watershed, which is about 80% agricultural land, which um, is more susceptible to polluted runoff because of how flat it is. The Mill Creek was actually flagged as the most endangered urban creek in the country as of 2017. And fast fashion plays a huge role in this. So over the past decade, fast fashion has grown exponentially from the rise of social media. And actually from 2000 to 2015, um, clothing sales have doubled, but the use of each item has gone down 36%. Fast fashion plays a huge role in the pollution of our watershed. So shipping and pollution and manufacturing pollution have actually produced 10% of global annual emissions, as well as the synthetic materials in clothing um, ends up in waterways and 85% um, of all discarded clothing items end up in landfills. Here's our budget. There's actually an itemized budget in the folder in your tote bags if you wanted to get a better look at that. Advertisement was a very big priority for us as it was the way that we got the word out about our clothing drive and we made it as successful as it was. So the principal sent out information in a group email that way parents from the elementary and middle schools could also hear about it as well as the high school. We made an Instagram page where we posted information and updates regularly about our clothing drive. We made Facebook posts. Thank you, mom. We made posters around the school and community and inside your folder is also a poster that we put around our community, except the ones that we put up were pretty and pink, but this helped grow the connection within our community. And then that brings us to our solution. We noticed that lots of people in our community consume a lot of material objects and maybe don't use them for as long as they could. And we wanted to do something to motivate people to reduce the amount that they buy and reuse by thrifting. We wanted to ease people into it because it was we're a very tight knit community. So we figure from this event, it'll be getting items from people that they trust and know in the community and more people would be likely to show up. So on Saturday, we collected the donations and one item that people brought in equaled one credit for them to shop with the next day. And on Saturday, we sorted all the items in our cafeteria. And then that brings us to the actual drive on Sunday. We also collected donations of canned food and toiletries if people didn't bring clothes the day before but still wanted to shop. Everyone was given um, a free tote bag like the ones that you have to shop with and to bring home and keep it to continue to reuse. And we made sure to have the bathrooms in our high school open so that people could try on the clothes and make sure that they did like them before bringing them home so that things would actually be used and wouldn't end up in a landfill again. Um, and we ended up getting over 1,050 items from our community at our drive. Okay, for our, sustainable, for our sustainable development goals, our first one is goal number 11, um, to keep our community inclusive, safe, and resilient for sustainable cities, specifically 11.6, to help our city reduce its adverse effects on the environment, and 11B, adding, to, adding our city to the growing number, implementing strategies for environmental change. Our next goal was goal number 12, to ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns, specifically 12.5, 7, and 8, to reduce waste generation through prevention, reduce, and recycling, produce sustainable, promote sustainable consumption, and raise awareness with prevalent information. We did this through our posters and Instagram. Our last goal is goal number 13, to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts, specifically 13.3, to improve education and awareness around climate change, specifically how we can adapt and mitigate its impacts. And then finally, continuation. 
We've talked to our volunteering club and they have agreed to take this project on in the future. We've given them all the unused materials like totes or posters that they can reuse. Um, and we really want to keep our community interested in thrifting year after year to reduce um, the clothing bought and continue to educate our community on how this is good for the watershed. Also on continuation, at our shop, we had this poster with QR codes up that has thrift stores in our area and um, online clothing brands that are more sustainable than typical fast fashion brands so that people can continue to shop sustainably, not only on the day of our drive. And then these are just some pictures of how many items we got, how full our cafeteria was, and then we donated all the extras to Matthew 25 to help make our impact global. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Did, did you have a plan for uh, handling scrap textile? Maybe if uh, people had clothing with company logos that they, you know, clipped off, uh, so they had maybe like a hole in the shirt or a hole in a baseball hat or something like that. Any any plan or, or ways to handle scrap textile? Any specific logos that maybe people wouldn't want? And we decided to, we sorted everything by section. So some of those items we put in a specific section and people actually were open to still receiving items that might've been slightly flawed with the availability of possibly fixing them in the future. Um, how many people came to the actual um, shop, shop day? Forty that actually came and donated, but then the next day for the shop, um, it was a it was a huge turnout. In the last hour, um, probably an extra like thirty people came. It was really, yeah. I also want to add, we got people from like multiple different communities, different schools all around. We got different age groups. We got kids that came for the kids section. We got uh, we got maternity like we got a whole bunch of like wide variety of people that came to our clothing drive and also everything we are wearing right now is from our clothing drive so yes fashion forward <laughs> Well, I totally should have gone to that drive instead of buying new pants, right? Okay, as the judges are tallying up those final scores on that group, I'm going to call up Riley and Gavin from Loveland High School to uh, talk about their program, Sign for Change. Uh, so my name is Riley Switzer. Uh, so my name is Riley Switzer, and this is my partner, Gavin Joyner, and our project is Sign for Change. 
So Gavin and my idea came from the long lines of cars that were idling at our high school. There in that photo, there are 20 cars, and this is 20 minutes before school ends, and this is every day for an entire school year. The exhaust from these cars include nitrogen oxide, benzene, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide. We wanted to inform the people about these dangerous gases and why they are harmful. So as you all know, we live, we live in the Ohio watershed, and it's very important to us because we have because we have 25 million people in it and it sustains all the life that's in our ecosystem uh it's also in charge of the all the air and the water that we have uh water being lakes rivers ponds and air is a key and air is a key part of the water quality because the gases inside the air directly correlate with the uh quality of the water and the ph uh so as i said pre previously the main issue has been long lines of cars uh, these cars can create dangerous gases to be emitted. Most gases that are uh, emitted are greenhouse gases, but some like nitrogen oxide can cause acidic rain. Acidic rain can cause erosion to happen, which can kill plants and lower biodiversity. Another gas that is produced is benzene. This is an, this is an extremely harmful gas and can have extremely negative effects on people's lungs. So we thought about it and we figured a good way to go about tackling this problem would be to create signs for drivers when they're uh, going past. We, they're informational. We put them up for anybody that has a car to understand and read. They're visible. We have 25 of them to put all over our community um, in highly populated locations, and they're easy to understand and effective, clear and to the point. That's what we were trying to go for. And we targeted uh, school districts and then local parks as recommended by principals and the city manager. So the effects that we hope to see from this is that it's going to be seen by a lot of people. 1,500 people go to our high school at the very least, and not to mention all the people in our community that's going to be seeing this every day. So the message is definitely going to be going, getting out to a lot of people. And um, it improves, it's going to improve air quality because of the uh, less emission from the harmful gases that are out there. And it's going to reduce acid rain and climate change to the decrease in the output of nitrogen oxide, which is a key contributor to climate change, as well as uh, other harmful effects to our bodies. And there's going to be more money back in your guys' pocket because it's going to save gas, less idling, less gas burned, less, mo less money spent. So this is helping with sustainable development goal 13, but specifically 13.2 and 13.3. 13.2 is integrating climate change measures into national policies and 13.3 is informing others of the problem. We're hoping that our signs uh, can help people see, see the signs and recognize them and therefore implement them going forward, which hopefully um, helps create a better ecosystem and a better life for our community. Uh, so Gavin and I bought uh, 25 signs in total for $750, and as well as the hardware to put them up. In total, the project costs $851.95. So thank you guys for listening. We've worked very hard on this. Hey, every day there's going to be tons of emissions unless we, until we are done with cars that stop emissions. So it's important that we take action for what we're doing every day if we're going to keep these cars around. Um, and so, yeah, just thank you for giving us the opportunity. And if you could take anything away from this presentation, it'd be to take this as a sign for change. Good morning and thank you for the presentation. Um, I do agree, simple, straightforward and, you know, and I, of course, how, I do have a question about what was the process of coming up with the actual verbiage? How did you decide? I mean, because few words, but, but they, they have big impact. How did you decide on that? We wanted it to be understandable for everybody, like no matter 16 to 90. So we, we figured might as well make it simple, easy to the, easy to the point to understand. So the message gets around to everybody to the same point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, but the focus on, you know, hurting children's lungs 
is a universal idea. So yeah, I, I, I understand that you're going to be putting them in different places beyond the school. Yes. Yeah. Where, yeah, I'll, like local parks where we've seen a lot of idling. I got I play baseball, so I've seen people waiting in their cars. I see people waiting to get their food picked up from restaurants in town. So a whole bunch of places in Loveland where people are sitting in their cars idling. We've recognized it. Um, I may be wrong about this, but are there certain things called no idling zones? I mean, is there any um, conversation about maybe trying to get something in place in your community that might be more of a policy than just a volunteer effort? Well, we, we don't know about that. We know that signs like have, like we already have, there's one actual sign that already exists at the high school, but it's only one sign in the back where it's like not many people are idling. So, and that sign isn't like a policy or anything, it's all comes to recommendation. We're trying to like force it a little bit more, make it more known. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just curious if you've had any feedback from the drivers yet. Okay. Thank you. My parents have stopped that. Excellent. Good job. <laughs> Okay, while the judges are finishing up on that uh, tabulation, I'm going to call up Gwendolyn from the Spencer Center for Gifted and Exceptional Students and her project, Reducing and Removing Litter at School. Hello, I am Gwendolyn Jones, and I am a senior from Spencer Center for Gifted and Exceptional Students. My project is about reducing and removing litter at school. According to Marine Debris Tracker, 1.78 items of litter per square meter are along the Ohio River and Cincinnati. This is higher than the average for the rest of the Ohio River, which is only 1.5 items. This problem can be traced back to our communities, and I aimed to tackle this issue in my community. The problem, initially I looked inside for my problem where students were throwing litter on the ground, but I soon realized that this problem was already solved by the custodial team as they collect and clean the hallways every day. So I then looked to see if the same kind of pattern of littering existed outside of the school, which it did. And it was quite bad as litter was never collected, allowing it to wash into storm drains, which then drained into the Ohio River, which could then injure or even kill wildlife. The main part of this problem was that there was nowhere to put waste outside and a secondary part is that there were no events organized to help clean the litter. To help with the litter cleanup, 
I worked with the faculty to organize events. And these events will continue to run at least monthly, facilitated by staff of student volunteers. There have been two cleanup events conducted since I began implementing this project and students have already come to me saying that they wanna participate in the next one. Cleaning up the litter is only addressing a symptom of the problem, but the main cause is, as I mentioned before, that there is no bins outside for waste to be placed in. My solution to prevent or at least reduce waste outside was to have bins installed. These bins were installed in a high traffic area near the playground and a seating area where students also wait to be picked up at dismissal. There are a large amount of students that go through this place every day. And before the cans were installed, there was litter all over the ground, which could then, as previously stated, wash into our environment and harm the ecosystem. There were installed was both a trash and recycling bin. So if you look at the budget in front of you in the folder, you can see that I spent most of the grant money towards the waste receptacles. And this is because I viewed the waste receptacles as a more important part of the solution than the litter cleanup. However, the litter cleanup events were still successful thanks to donations and supplies already at the school. The sustainable development goal that my project most closely aligns with is goal 14, addressing safety of life below water. This event, these trash cans and the cleanup events have already had a significant local impact with 180 gallons of trash estimated being collected across two events. And that leads me to believe that there was a total amount of trash, 1,080 gallons per year. There's been a visible decrease in litter around the school campus and there have been over 50 participants, that's 50 people taking these lessons to their own communities. The trash cans will be emptied daily by the custodial team in order to keep the place clean. The recycling will be emptied by the recycling club, which is already established at least twice a week. The events will be conducted using advisory periods that have already been in place. Teachers will be encouraging students of all grades, and these plans will ensure that the impact continues long after I graduate. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. And if one thing that I learned from this project is that everyone can make a difference. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'll just reiterate what I said earlier. I really appreciate your uh, project on addressing trash. I think it's an important issue. Um, and it, it's, I appreciate everybody taking the effort to do that. Uh, you mentioned that you saw um, you know, a visual improvement. Any comment from the custodial staff to say that uh, they've noticed uh, less time going around the property picking up trash and that it's all uh, being effectively used in the trash cans. Any comments from, from a staffing standpoint? There haven't been any comments, but um, one of the main reasons that I did this project is that there wasn't any cleaning being done outside around the campus. So this project was to make sure that there was cleaning. And you said that you visually confirmed that this is making an impact. Yes. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Um, there has been less trash strewn about. Students have been commenting 
that it looks nice of. I also, uh, just to follow up a little bit, appreciate um, you had a comprehensive approach and I appreciate the fact that you pulled in other partners that were already within your system, your ecosystem there that could complement and then sustain the project. Um, it really does begin with us. And I think you've made some important first steps. Uh, what, what kinds of things um, might you do? Has this inspired you to do any other kinds of things in the future or any other things in this area? Um, another possible thing that I could do for this project is to have a recycling bin available in the cafeteria as there currently isn't one and there's a lot of recyclable things that are going into the landfills. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sandra. I don't know about you guys, but I am certainly inspired. Amazing, amazing job. As the judges are finishing up the tabulation on Gwendolyn's project, um, I am gonna pull up our next group. Maybe, there we go. So our next group here that's coming onto the stage, we have from Loveland High School, Olivia, Sophia, Wyatt, and Jacob with the impact of styrofoam lunch trays. Oh, let me grab the easel for you, I'm sorry. Grace, will you grab that easel right there? We can set it up right here. Who's doing the clicker? I am. Okay. Um, just forward and backward. And Thank you. Just a minute. Okay. Guys, take it away. Hi, everyone. My name is Olivia, and these are my teammates, Sophie, Jake, and Wyatt. We are super excited to share with you today our Caring for Watersheds project. Without further ado, this is the impact of styrofoam. Our local watershed is the Little Miami River. So many people who are affected by the watershed daily. The river travels through five counties in the Cincinnati area and is about 111 miles long and affects roughly 4,000 people. Have you ever been through a drive through and received your food in a styrofoam container? Or maybe you've gotten your drink in a styrofoam cup. Or maybe you've even gotten your lunch from a school cafeteria in a tray just like this one. Sorry. For our project, we have worked with our food services director and our head cook to reduce our consumption of styrofoam trays and instead switch to trays just like this one. As you most likely know, styrofoam is one of the worst materials we use in our daily lives. In fact, during the pro producing of styrofoam trays, it releases over 50 chemical byproducts into the environment. Though we are very much aware that paper products do release chemicals into the air and waterways, it is not nearly as, styro as much as styrofoam trays. In fact, during the decomposing of styrofoam trays, it takes 500 years to decompose, while paper trays only take two to six weeks. So that is way more. And essentially, none of us have actually seen styrofoam fully decompose in our lifetimes, and we never will. 
LHS uses 48,750 styrofoam trays in one school year. I'm a senior and I graduate in two weeks, which means that 195,000 trays have been used in just my four years. And every single, one, every single one of them will end up in a landfill and take generations to decompose. Um, so immediately we're gonna have an impact on about 1,400 students. But more importantly, we're gonna have an impact on the entire Little Miami River watershed which includes us, wildlife, marine life, everything, because the creation and disposal of styrofoam, it releases a lot of harmful toxins into the air, into the water, everywhere. And um, we're hoping to encourage other schools to make the same change uh, that we're making with our trays. So with the money that we've gotten from uh, Carry for Our Watersheds, we bought 10,080 trays, which was enough to take us through a quarter of the school year. So it'll finish off the school year and continue into the next one. And we also bought five window cleans and two posters to advertise the change that we're making. Our project oversees many sustainable development goals, including goal six, clean water and sanitation, and goal 12, or and goal 14, life below water. Um, more in detail, 6.3, minimize the release of chemicals, and 14.1, prevent marine pollution from land-based activities. But the most important one is goal 12, regarding responsible consumption, and more importantly, encouraging businesses to practice sustainable projects. This hits our goal exactly because we have changed from styrofoam trays to paper trays, which helps the waterways and the airways in our environment. These are the posters we have made and hung up in our lunchroom where kids walk by daily to get their food and trays. And these are the clings we have made and put on the silver holder and the produce section of our lunchroom. Thank you for an opportunity to make a change in our school. Presentation in your project. Just curious, um, you worked with the cafeteria staff. Just curious if they provided any feedback that made you rethink or, you know, pivot your project at all based on their input. Yes. So the reason that we have initially been using these styrofoam trays is because they are the easiest and the most um, effective for students to use. For example, um, our food services director made sure to point out that on days where we have like fruit with like um, the liquid with it or on spaghetti day, it sort of seeps through into this container, which isn't great for the students, but you kind of, you have to weigh the costs at the, at the end of the day. And a huge benefit of the paper ones is they're way more sturdy. So with the foam trays, they do like fall apart and you have to like really hold them. But with the paper trays, it's way easier to hold so that you can hold more and you don't have to take multiple trips or you can just take like you can just take one instead of multiple. Are there any other questions? We'd like to share this question. <laughs> with, um, anyway, um, with the cost difference between um, are we saving money? Um, so they're not, paper trays are more expensive, but since we're playing with paper trays right now, we're saving things. Yeah, we're saving So that would be a follow-up question. Um, wonder if there's any discussion with how they could either reallocate or find some other, I don't know, sources for the money needed. Um, the trays are only about three to 
five cents, like a difference per tray. And with our school just now passing the levy, we are hoping to have more money for like <laughs> things like this. So you're going to need to get to that board meeting soon. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Judges, sorry, that took a minute to come on. While the judges are uh, wrapping up the scores, we'll get set up for our final student presentation from Ethan and Colin from uh, Wyoming High School and their proposal, The Vapes of Wrath. All right, I hope you guys are all doing great today. Um, I'm Cullen. Uh, my name is Ethan Hatcher, and I'm a senior at Wyoming High School. Yep, and our project is Vapes of Wrath, Tackling the Effects of Vaping on Health and the Environment. So I would first like to bring up the Mill Creek Watershed, which stretches across more than 160 square miles and includes 37 cities and townships, nearly 500,000 people. And so in 1997, the Mill Creek Watershed was actually designated as the most polluted and uh, physically degraded stream in the United States. And uh, much has been done in recent years to improve the quality of the stream. But considering thousands of Cincinnatians work and live in this area, you know, it's important that we take care of the pollution and also hazardous waste inside the stream. When you first heard about our project, you might've wondered, why did we choose vaping? One of the main reasons that we chose vaping was the increasing popularity. According to the FDA in 2022, one in 10 middle school and high school students reported using an e-cigarette in the last 30 days. And as you can see from the graph above, incidents of vaping have drastically increased in the past couple of years. Another problem is the dangers to health that are associated with vaping. The American Lung Association reports that uh, vaping is actually linked to increased cardiovascular disease and lung cancer. And keep in mind that these are things that many young people in our community are using. There are also many dangers to the environment that are associated with vaping. Most of these uh, result from the components of vapes, such as plastic, lithium batteries, and many toxic chemicals. And when these vapes are not properly disposed of, these can find their ways in the environment and cause major problems for our watershed. There's also a severe lack of education surrounding vaping. The Truth, in the Truth Initiative reports that almost 50% of young e-cigarette users don't know how to properly dispose of their vaping products. Our plan to counteract this begins with education. We found many posters from the National Institute of Health and the FDA which dive into the different negative effects associated with vaping on both health and the environment. And there are also many posters that uh, teach people about proper ways to dispose of waste, uh, to, to dispose of vaping waste. We also created a website that goes into these things as well and also details our future plans for uh, counteracting vaping. And you can see that with the QR code above. The second part of our plan, plan was disposal of the vaping products. So essentially what we did was we purchased um, Sharps containers and rebranded them to be used for vapes. We put these up in places around our community where it would, be, it would be convenient for people to dispose of their vapes and know that they would be uh, properly disposed of. Uh, and then uh, once these vapes are, um, once these containers are full, we will take them to hazardous waste facilities so that they can be properly disposed of. All right. So here's our budget. Um, the first part of this has to do with the disposal element. 
which is actually the most expensive part of the budget. And I'd like to draw attention to the hardware costs here. Um, the hardware is cost effective, and um, it's something that could be implemented in a lot of places throughout our state, throughout the nation. Um, it's an exciting, it's a simple, it's an effective method um, to provide a safe disposal resource for um, vaping products, e-cigarettes, which are increasing in popularity. Um, I think it's, we found it really important to provide that um, in places where there's a lot of young people. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, concerning the effects on the health, on health too, um, we wanted to make sure we could reduce the quantity of vaping products. So the hardest part about actually implementing our project was um, working out many of the problems that were associated with it. So potential concerns such as uh, theft and also the legality of many vaping products led to it being very hard to get our projects approved initially. Because of this, over the past couple of months, we've had to work extensively with people like, like our high school principal, the Wyoming Police Department, and our mentor, Gia, in order to make sure that our plan could become a reality. Because of this, we were able to put up posters around our community uh, and in our school in order to uh, increase education about uh, the dangers of vaping on both health and the environment. We were also able to set up uh, vape collection containers at the Wyoming Recreation Center, the Wyoming Police Station, and California Woods. These are some of the pictures. All right, so our project uh, addresses several sustainable development goals as set forth by United Nations. Um, those include number three, good health and well being, number 12, responsible consumption and production, number 14, life below water, and number 15, life on land. And these are some of the pictures of our project. And then these are all the sources that we use. Are there any questions? Um, good morning. Um, hi. Um, you repurposed Sharps. You, that's an interesting idea. Um, have you, I mean, what, are they getting filled up? I mean, are, what? What, how long have they been in, in place? Yeah, so uh, because we had a lot of problems getting them approved initially and we had to go through so much red tape to actually get them installed, they've only actually been up for the past week or two. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been hard to tell like how successful they're going to be, but we're really hopeful that they'll have a lasting impact on our community. Sure. But, but who's doing the collection of, at your different locations? Who's collecting the used material? Yeah, so um, we actually partnered uh, pretty extensively with the uh, Wyoming City. So um, essentially the plan is we're gonna, we've set them up at the Wyoming Rec Center and the Wyoming Police Station. And um, essentially now it's just become a city, a city uh, official at Wyoming. It's their job now to collect these boxes once they're full and they'll uh, bring them to a hazardous waste facility where they'll be properly disposed of. Okay, great, thank you. A little judging behind the scenes, I will tell you, um, when this project first came through, uh, all of the judges loved it. And our question was, is that legal? <laughs> like, can we even do that? Like, you know, so we had, we had extensive conversations about that one. Um, but yeah, it just goes to show what some dedicated students can do. Okay, before I let you go, we have just a few more things from me. Okay, so get my notes back out. Okay, so So that is all, yeah, that one works a lot better. That is all 10 of our presentations. So I would like to just take a minute. Everybody can just 
Take a deep breath. <laughs> you guys all did amazing. Um, we have been talking a little bit behind the scenes how original some of these ideas have been this year um, and really, really just amazing things that these students are doing. So this, again, empowers us, it empowers you. Um, we've already seen change take place, whether that's in our own local community or even our own little house, um, when we're turning off our car idling or whatever it is. Um, I do wanna bring your attention to um, this project as well. Every year, Okay, not sure why that's doing that. Every year, uh, caring for our watersheds, it's, it's just gonna stay on that slide maybe. So the last slide, which I apparently put a click on through, um, <laughs> caring for our watersheds implements one idea from one of our contests throughout all of our contest areas, okay? So we call it our international implementation. And this year, we picked a project from a group of middle school students. It's the only Caring for Our Watershed project that works with middle school students. But the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Contest uh, works with middle school students. And these students from the Eco Bees Green Team from Herndon, elementary in Virginia um, had a project to save the purple martin, which is a very, very beneficial bird, eats lots of um, bad insects, maybe not bad insects, may, may, eats some maybe not so beneficial insects. And so they installed uh, purple martin houses around their schoolyard. And so at our last meeting, um, all of the global coordinators got together and we picked this as our international idea. So I'm going to play this video, hopefully for you. So we decided to implement this project. Like I said, um, every region had a drawing for a Purple Martin house to install at a local school or park to encourage the nesting of Purple Martins. And uh, we had a drawing here in Ohio and Spencer Center actually won. So I'm guessing here you don't have it yet. It has... Okay, so pieces of it are arriving at Spencer Center um, to help implement that uh, international idea. So maybe one of these 10 ideas will be our international idea uh, next year. I will certainly fight for that to happen, um, but we'll see. Like I said, we have eight contests. So we have 80 different um, ideas to choose from. Um, so now it's time to take a break. It's time to get some lunch. 
It's time to wander around the zoo and enjoy this beautiful day. Okay, so what we're going to do next, I'm going to ask you to allow our judges to go first because they have the super important job now of tallying all their scores and um, talking about all of that stuff. So we're going to have them go through the lunch line first, and then we're going to sequester them in one of these classrooms. And then I encourage all of you to go through the lunch line, grab some lunch, and then wander, I did not make this up, the greenest zoo in America, okay? So the, the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden has done amazing things to really green up their zoo. Um, from recycling water in their exhibits, they have green roofs. Um, in fact, I think currently, I don't see any zoo folks to tell me wrong. Um, I think currently they are 30% off the stormwater grid, which means they capture 30% of the rainwater that comes into the zoo. Um, and the hope is to be a 100% off the stormwater grid in eight to 10 years. And that new, so we're dealing with construction down in that corner where they're putting the new elephant exhibit. And they did the same thing in Africa. They actually have a huge detention basin under the exhibit area, under where the animals roam, that they are actually capturing that water and they are recycling it and they're cleaning it and they're using it in their exhibits. So just lots of different things that the Cincinnati Zoo is doing to contribute to sustainability. So please wander around, have your lunch and be back here and we'll get started as close to 2.15 as we possibly can. So another round of applause for all of our students. <laughs> 